Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, we're going to get started. You're on. You're attending the Resilink Supply Chain Resiliency Leadership Series webcast, the Supply Chain Resiliency Research and Practice. I'm your host for today, John Bovet. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Resilink. This webcast is one in a series we are hosting uh, on various supply chain resiliency and risk management topics. We hope you enjoy it. On today's webcast, we'll have three featured speakers. The first speaker will be Simon Ellis, Practice Director, Supply Chain Strategies at I IDC Manufacturing Insights. The second speaker will be Vani French, Vice President of Supply Chain Operations, Palo Alto Networks. And finally, um, Bindia Vakil will be the final speaker. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of Resilink. All the speakers today are accomplished supply chain practitioners and thought leaders with many years of experience in dealing with supply chain resiliency issues. I'm sure you'll enjoy each of today's speakers. As a reminder, if you have any questions for the speakers at the end of the webcast, we will have a question and answer period at the end. Please use the chat feature to send them to me. I'm the host, uh, John Bovet. The slides also will be made available um, to attendees after the webcast. For the agenda today, We'll start off with Simon, and he will discuss supply chain resiliency from a cross-industry research perspective and discuss why he believes it's, it's time uh, to address this topic in a proactive way. He recently published a report arguing the need for supply chain resiliency in 2013 and beyond. This, this report is actually available for download off of the uh, Resilink website. If anybody uh, can't find it, I can send you the link to, uh, to download that after the presentation today. Next, Vani French will cover her firsthand experience in tackling supply chain risk and resiliency. Vani actually presented about a year ago, and she will update us all on the team's progress and where they are taking the program in the future. And last but not least, uh, Bindia will discuss some best practice approaches she has observed from working with many different customers across many different industries. And as I mentioned, we will wrap up with some question and answer before closing today. Again, feel free to use the chat feature to send me any questions that you might have. So why are we here today? If none of us were concerned about the potential for supply chain disruptions, we, mo we most likely uh, wouldn't have uh, be interested in this topic today. And yet thousands of practitioners search for ways to measure, and monitor, and combat risk every day. The simple fact is that supply chain disruptions happen nearly every day. According to Resilink's historical data on notifications covering supply chain risk events during the last year, Approximately 24 unique events, on average, occur each month. Our findings further showed that, that these unique supply chain disruption events happen global, globally and often in remote locations, and as a result, they're often difficult to detect and mitigate. One recent example was at the uh, SK Hynix plant in China. As you can see from the chart, our data shows that factory fires and explosions occur very frequently, and the SK Hynix plant is just one example. So what, without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton to Simon first. I know we have uh, probably a lot of questions, and I think people are really interested to hear, uh, hear from the speakers today. Simon? Oh, thank you, John. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to folks who have uh, called in, wherever you may be in the world. Um, so as, as John says, my, uh, my job here today is to kind of set the stage. Um, uh, as he mentioned, I, I recently wrote a, a, a fairly long research report uh, entitled Arguing the Case for Supply Chain Resiliency in, in 2013. And 
you know, I've covered um, supply chains for a very long time, and, and certainly researched um, both as a as an end user and as a, as a as a market researcher, sort of the concepts of risk and, and uh, risk management and, and, and responsiveness, and kind of sort of uh, summarized all of those things in under this sort of nice nice notion of uh, of supply chain resiliency. Um, so on my next slide, um, I've got I've got this this graphic that I have come to refer to as kind of the business challenge and. You know, companies, manufacturers uh, have lots of challenges in their supply chains, um, and you know, I suppose it's a bit presumptuous to suggest that uh, you know this one is the challenge. But it's something that I hear a lot, something that I hear from a lot of manufacturers, which is this notion of sort of the holistic supply chain having two distinct sides: the supply side and the demand side. Supply complexity is growing on the supply side; uh, lead times are lengthening. Supply networks are getting deeper. You know, it's not just your suppliers; it's your supplier, supplier, and your supplier, 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 and on and on and on. But at the same time, on the demand side, for many of these businesses, for many manufacturers, uh, demand volatility is up. The the sort of the speed of the demand side is is picking up pace. The the sort of the the ability to uh, understand demand, to forecast demand, to come up with a forecast is is uh, is increasingly difficult and. When you kind of put these two things side by side and, and you sort of say, well, the two sides have to complement each other and, and you know, supply supplies for demand, um, if the supply is slower and demand is faster, you get increasingly these, these kind of disconnects. And this is where I think you see, um, certainly on the supply side, as you have disruptions, that the the impact uh, you know we've all seen the sort of the bulb effect uh, sort of uh, academically over the years uh, and perhaps in practice as well but you see this sort of increasing disconnect between the two sides and an and an inability frankly for um you know the kinds of buffers that we've traditionally used inventory and and uh, and, and and uh, order quantities you know an, an inability to to kind of to manage those disconnects and and, and we see increasing um out of stocks and persistent out of stocks, right? I mean, time to recovery, I think, is a is an interesting metric for supply chains in terms of kind of risk management and resiliency. And we see, you know, a lot of businesses with um, time to recovery numbers that are far worse than, than than they were five years ago, and certainly worse than they were ten years ago. So this kind of this kind of notion of the two sides of the supply chain, I think, is something to keep in mind. You know, as we go through the the webcast today, as kind of the driver in many ways for a lot of businesses to think uh, perhaps differently or think think more um, more more purposefully about this notion of of, of resiliency. Um, so on the next slide, um, I, you know, I thought that it's it's sometimes useful to sort of get a sense as to you know what, what's the what's the what's the stake in the ground. Um, and as I was as I was writing the the research report. Um, you know, I started thinking about a lot of different things that sort of would make up resiliency. It's, you know, I think there's a tendency sometimes for people to think of risk uh, management and resiliency, resiliency as the same thing. I don't think they are. I think one is actually a, a, a subset of the other. Um, but when thinking about r the scope of resiliency, you know, it certainly is risk assessment, right? You've got lots of of vulnerabilities in the supply chain, both external and, and internal, you know, do, do you know, risk assess, uh, understand sort of the notion of, of, of kind of your readiness to respond to things. Um, risk mitigation and response planning. Um, I think, you know, again, the sort of the strategic tactical things that the supply chain has done. Um, I, I, you know, risk mitigation, you know, I have these conversations with manufacturers all the time, you know, just because you see a risk in the supply chain um, doesn't mean you necessarily have to actively mitigate it. It may be perfectly acceptable to have a rapid response capability in place. So I think both of those things are are are, are on the table, and I think they're clearly part of this sort of broader notion of, of resiliency. Um, I think kind of event slash crisis management coordination, you know, have the people in place, um, uh, have the have the capabilities in place to quickly manage disruptions um, and communicate status. I've, I've I've worked with manufacturers many times who have had um, who have had disruptions, and because they responded more quickly than perhaps their competitors did, you know they were able to take advantage of of what actually may be limited alternatives um, that uh, you know are only available to the to the early movers. And so this notion of of kind of having a team in place and and, and you know, having sort of the proper level of, level of event management and coordination is really important. 
you know, obviously response to execution, you know, how do we actually do? Did we, uh, did all of these things that we had in place actually help? And, and, and were we able to, uh, to get the business back uh, running uh, quickly and, and have the, that sort of time to recovery be very short? Uh, and then, of course, the sort of the, the, the notion of kind of ongoing monitoring and reporting and having feedback, feedback loops to understand how we did and, and how we can do better uh, in, 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 the, in the future. Um, on the next slide, I, I sort of um, I, I thought a little bit about sort of you know okay what is it what is it uh, you know that those definitions on the price slide notwithstanding you know uh, okay what does it mean and, and I think for me the sort of the the notion that summarizes it most nicely is that it's the necessity for supply chain speed in the context of complexity and data overload that requires manufacturing supply chains to embrace resiliency and become what I've called in the report massively multidimensional. Um, and, and, you know, other than being kind of a phonetic mouthful, um, you know, massively multidimensional is, again, this notion that on the supply side of the supply chain and on the demand side, you have lots of different kinds of businesses. I mean, we see um, across manufacturing businesses in multiple product categories, many of which behave differently and which need to be addressed and which need to be managed uh, in, in different ways. Um, some might be managed for lead time, others might be managed for cost. And so this notion of a massively multidimensional supply chain, I think is a further justification for, for, the, for the need for and, and the appeal of, um, of supply chain resiliency. Um, you know, we've all heard or at least uh, uh, heard about big data and analytics and, and uh, you know, whether, uh, whether you view it as, a, as kind of a, a buzzword marketing hype or not, the reality is that companies are facing a, a blizzard of data, much of which they don't know what to do with. And so, you know, how they manage that in the context of the supply chain and how that, that, that impacts the ability to respond, I think, is important. We see, um, you know, companies increasingly looking at product quality and product safety, um, you know, inventory management is something that, that most businesses would put, or most supply chains would put uh, right near the top of the list. Um, but oftentimes, you know, the you know the CFO might be happy with the number, you know, the inventory number, the inventory value, but it actually may or may not be productive. And so we see, you know, when companies start thinking about resiliency and how to bridge the gap between the demand and supply sides of the supply chain, we see them thinking a little bit differently about inventory and, and perhaps, you know, not having it so much in finished goods, maybe having it in, inter, in intermediary steps or as components. Um, you know, for me, the sort of the notion of, you know, responsiveness versus forecasting is a really important one when you think about resiliency and you think about um, the ability to, to sort of meet the service obligations of your supply chain. Um, you know, I've worked with lots of companies who have, said to me, well, you know, we need to improve the forecast and then everything will be great. Um, well, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe your forecast is actually good enough and that, uh, uh, that in fact, you know, the forecast is just a forecast and that uh, the moment you kind of cast it in stone, it starts to be wrong. And so you need the ability to respond to those small changes. And, and you know, I think for me, um, you know, risk management, responsiveness, resiliency is not just about the big things. It's also about the little things, right? The sort of the the little little sort of changes in demand every day that drive cost and drive service issues. Um, and so, so the things the things um, you know on this list are effectively, for me, the drivers of, of resiliency. The things that companies have to think about. Um, the last point I, I would mention here um, is, um, is is sort of the notion of extreme granularity, uh, which links back to this notion of big data, right? If you're a multi, uh, a massively multi-dimensional supply chain, um, you're going to need to leverage, you're going to need to harness the levels of data granularity, perhaps that you weren't used to two or three years ago. And I think you know, as you think about resiliency, as you think about supply chain effectiveness. Um, you have to think about about all of this data. You have to think about the granular level of, of the data. Um, on the next slide, um, it, you know, this is just kind of a, a graphic. I, I love uh, <laughs> I love graphics. Um, uh, you know, whether it's worth a thousand words or not, uh, I, I I wouldn't say. I'd leave that to you. But um, but uh, you know, this again, I think for me is sort of the notion of graphically the notion of the resilient supply chain, the sort of the supply side, the demand side the sort of the things in the middle that sort of drive resiliency and, and allow me to manage effectively across the across the divide. Um, 
the blue the the blue uh, uh, ovals you know are the kinds of things that are impacting uh, externally um, the, the the two sides of the supply chain. So on the supply side, you know, long lead times, global 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 complexity. Um, uh, sort of profitable proximity, the ability to, or, or the, the moving of uh, supply closer to demand, um, you know, the, the, the various levels of, of SRM, supplier relationship management, uh, on the demand side. And, and these things don't apply to all businesses, but, you know, pressure from customers on lead time compression, um, mass customization, uh, you know, thinking uh, sort of about, uh, you know, segmenting customers differently or, or, or actually, uh, Using kind of modern postponement techniques, they're all things I think that sort of kind of peck from the outside at the supply chain and and frankly drive uh, an ever higher need for uh, for this notion of resiliency and, and and to get to this sort of state of of, of supply chain resiliency. Um, on the uh, on the next slide, um, I just I just and I I sort of alluded to this earlier, um, and I think it's it's perhaps. Um, um, sort of, you know, intuitively obvious to, to most that, you know, supply chains are more complex uh, than they've ever been. Um, you know, perhaps perhaps downstream is uh, more similar today to 10 years ago than upstream is. But, you know, as manufacturers and, and look, I mean, let's let's be honest, many manufacturers aren't actually manufacturers anymore, right? They're brand owners and they're outsourcing manufacturers to contract uh, suppliers. Um, those contract suppliers are using suppliers who are who in turn are using suppliers. So, you know, the ability of, of the business to think about resiliency and think about risk mitigation requires you to look, you know, multiple levels down. It's not just good enough to diversify to tier one supply if all your tier one suppliers are dependent on a single tier two supplier. You, you know, you've spent time and effort and achieved essentially nothing. So I think as you think about risk and as we think about resiliency, it's important to think uh, more broadly, I think, perhaps than, than, uh, than we might have uh, uh, in, in years past. Um, on, the, on, the, on the next slide, um, I just, you know, the, one of the questions I get is, you know, why now? You know, what's the sort of, what's the appeal now? Um, and, and I think it's because of the things that we've done both externally, internally, and the things that are being done to us externally um, are driving higher levels of risk, whether it's, you know, I talk a, a lot um, about the three W's, right? Weather, work, and worker, uh, excuse me, weather, war, and workers. Um, energy costs, uh, global trade, um, natural disasters, all of these the conflict minerals um, is, are all external things that are driving higher risk. Internally, you know, we've kind of moved to just-in-time kind of forecast-centric uh, businesses. We're, you know, leading our supply chains to the point uh, where in some cases they're actually brittle. We've got long, again, we've got internal long lead times. So we've got sort of, you know, almost a perfect storm in a way, kind of impinging on the middle and driving up supply chain risk. Um, on the um, on the next slide, um, I, I, uh, I I thought I would just um, get back to the point that I that I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, I think when people think about supply chain risk management, they think about resiliency. There's always a tendency to go to floods, earthquakes, tsunamis. You know, the kinds of big things that we all read about, and you know, they have enormous impact on the supply chain. No question. And they're difficult to they're difficult to predict. They're difficult to forecast. Um, but it's not just those things. It's also you know less sort of strategic elements. You know the tactical risks, supplier default, uh, inventory damage. You know warehouse floods, uh, warehouse closure, operational risk, right? Shipment delays, quality holds, forecast error. So I, I think you know as you as you talk about. Um, um, as you talk about supply chain risk and you talk about resiliency, I think it's important to look at the whole here, and not just sort of the, the sort of the, st the strategic end. Um, uh, and so, and so on the next slide, um, uh, you know, I, I talked, um, I've talked generally here a bit about manufacturing, um, but manufacturing is a broad industry, right? There's lots of different elements of it, and, and at IDC we tend to chop it up into four groups that we have here on the slide. Uh, and we tend to look at them from the perspective of uh, kind of, you know, supply complexity on the y-axis, demand complexity on the x-axis, um, and kind of where sort of manufacturers seem to be focusing risk and resiliency effort, efforts. Um, 
you know, for the engineering oriented folks, it's really on the supply side. For the brand oriented folks, it tends to be on the demand side. And for the technology oriented manufacturers, actually, who have the, the distinct pleasure of high complexity on both, it is actually to focus on both. And so when we think about the appeal for resiliency on the next slide, um, you know, we see. Um, um, you know, a, a somewhat lower appeal for resiliency where customers, uh, where, where, where companies like the asset-oriented folks have low supply and demand complexity. Uh, doesn't mean there's no appeal, but it tends to be lower, uh, certainly higher in the technology-oriented value chains where, um, where, where, as I said, you have a lot of demand complexity and a lot of supply complexity. So the pressures of interacting, of, of managing across the supply and, and demand um, sides of the supply chain are, are greater. And so we, we tend to see the appeal higher in the right in the upper right quadrant, lower in the, in the lower left, and and uh, and uh, moderate, I think, in the in the in the bottom right and and, uh, and top left. Um, so on the next slide, um, you, you know, I, I I mean, I talk to a lot of a lot of manufacturers, um, and, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read all these things. You know, you'll have you'll have access to the slides. Um, but these are just some examples of comments that I've gotten from manufacturers. Um, you know, the one I like uh, actually the most is the one in the middle, which is, you know, supply chain risks, not just about trying to predict the big events necessarily. It's about navigating the dozens of little disruptions that happen in our supply network uh, every day. Um, you know, for our business, supply chain resiliency is about trying to prevent service failures, certainly, but it's also about ensuring that when service failures do occur, they're not protracted, right? So this notion, again, of, of kind of um, limiting or, or, or speeding time to recovery. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, the, the other piece here that I like a lot because it reflects the reality for many businesses is, you know, investments in risk awareness and mitigation have been difficult to justify in the past, um, but growing concerns for the impacts of extreme weather and regulations for conflict minerals are raising awareness. And this actually from a global steel manufacturer who I would put in the, you know, the acid-oriented value chain uh, grouping, which was the one that I said is in the bottom left and, and has the lowest appeal, but not no appeal, right? There's still some interest when they start when you start thinking about um, about things like uh, like conflict minerals. Um, so these are these are just some 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 verbatim comments uh, from manufacturers uh, that I've that I've uh, collected in the last uh, six months that I think are, are sort of have, dri have driven my view. That so sort of this notion of risk management and resiliency is is really a hot topic and a top priority for for many manufacturers. Um, next slide, please. So I think you know in um, you know in closing, uh, you know broadly the sort of the IDC manufacturing insights opinion. Um, I think you know summarizing the notion for me about the requirement for manufacturers to become resilient and. You know, manage this kind of massive multidimensionality that is that is inherent to their supply chains. Um, I think there's no question that supply chain resiliency and risk management is climbing on the leadership agenda for the supply chain, um, and if it hasn't already, will become a top priority. Um, and I think you know, as as service performance uh, really um, vies with cost as as the as the top strategic priority for many manufacturers. Um, you know, the ability to ensure, as we say here, consistent and re repeatable supply really is critical. Um, and I think, um, you know, industry tools and approaches to do a better job of managing risk um, and, and sort of give you sort of a, a window into resiliency, um, you know, have been generally fragmented and incomplete, but I don't think that's as true as it was. And certainly the work that, that I've done with, with John and the folks at, uh, at, at ResiLink suggests that, uh, that, that we're starting to see some tools that actually can manage the, the holistic no notion of risk and resiliency. So, um, so, that, so John, that's that's kind of my view, um, my my sort of context, if you will, for the for the notion. Um, let me turn it uh, back to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And again, if anybody has any questions for Simon or any of the speakers, feel free to uh, use the chat function. Uh, Vani. Yeah, thank you, John, and uh, thank you very much, Simon. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I've been in the industry for over 25 years in various material and supply chain roles. Currently, Vice President of Supply Chain Operations here at Palo Alto uh, for just about seven years. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the presentation today. Moving on to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our, our about Palo Alto Networks, um, our resiliency program after 
the first year and uh, the impact of supply chain resiliency to us directly. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about lessons learned and what our uh, go forward plan is. So um, we, uh, we launched our supply chain resiliency program over a year ago. And I presented last year, so I thought it would be a great idea to look back on our accomplishments this past year. Um, I'd also like to discuss what I believe the impact and the value of our supply chain resiliency efforts are thus far. Um, and it's always nice to be able to highlight the achievements of the team involved, because there's definitely been a lot of effort, both uh, on my side with my supply chain team as well as with ResLink. Um, and then finally, I'll discuss some lessons learned um, from this past year. Again, what we're going to do kind of going forward into 2014. Next slide, please. So just a little overview about Palo Alto Networks. Uh, Palo Alto has pioneered the next generation of network security appliances with our innovative platform that allows uh, customers to secure their network and safely enable increasingly complex and rapidly growing number of applications. We offer a variety of firewall platforms that can deliver network security anywhere you need it and for any size of enterprise, regardless of the office location or placement. We have about 13,500 customers in over 120 countries. We have added over 1,000 customers per quarter for the last seven quarters. So it's extremely critical that we're able to deliver our products when our customers need them. Next slide, please. So looking back on the last year, we really have accomplished many things from our supply chain resiliency program to date. The first is that we successfully put the program in place, established and trained and grew the team. Uh, I added over a, a few different supply base managers to my supply chain team here and, uh, and really kicked off and embedded the program into our overall operation. A key in, is clearly uh, in it, it first steps in any long-term business objective. Um, the second point is through the focused efforts of the entire extended team, both, again, on my supply chain team as well as ResLink, we've been able to gain much greater visibility into our global multi-tier supply chain than ever before. Real value generation, as I will discuss shortly. And then finally, we were able to put in place a comprehensive supply chain crisis preparedness and response process. A critical milestone to increase overall supply chain resiliency and visibility. Next slide, please. So one year into our resiliency program and what does it look like? The increased supply chain visibility that we've been able to achieve has particularly very, uh, has been very exciting. As we all know, better data and visibility is a key enabler uh, to overall decision making. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that in more detail. By us mapping our supply chain footprint, we now have a better understanding of where our products are being manufactured globally across hundreds of sites. Our supply chain currently spreads across 16 different countries with particular concentrations in China, Taiwan, Japan, and here in the United States. And by way of our supply chain visibility, uh, which now includes beyond just tier one, we're also able to see which subcontractors our direct suppliers are using. And in many cases, we can even see the supplier's suppliers. So with this sub-tier data, we're able to see the partner dependencies. In other words, which of our direct suppliers are also using the same subcontractors. I'll discuss the benefits of the multi-tier visibility shortly, but you can imagine the value this data can bring to a supply chain function. We can also see by country which are the top countries that touch our supply chain and which ones have greater sub-tier versus direct tier presence. For example, we all know that Taiwan or even Korea are two countries where many sub-tier partners are located. And then finally, the ability to understand product and part level resiliency has been extremely critical. Which of our parts are single source from a site with very high recovery time? Which parts are high risk and also support high revenue products? Without this level of data, we would not be able to make critical business decisions around our entire supply chain operation. 
Next slide, please. So what happens if we do, in fact, face some sort of a supply chain disruption or crisis? Having data to support proactive planning is valuable, but to be truly resilient supply chain, we need to have a well-thought-out strategy for crisis preparedness and fast response. So we created our approach focused on assessment, coordination, and collaboration and execution. The first step, which uh, is crisis assessment, starts by first being able to be on top of global events, which can have disruptive consequences to our business. For our team, this is especially critical because we compete in the marketplace for parts and capacity with much larger companies. Therefore, early notification is absolutely critical, ensuring that we are immediately on top of an event and first to acquire inventory or capacity. I'm sure we've all faced this in our day-to-day -day challenges, but for this monitoring, we are leveraging EventWatch. Um, EventWatch is a supply chain monitoring service from Resilink. Resilink EventWatch provides us with a scalable way to monitor the outside world for things like natural disasters, strikes of any kind, factory fires like the one we experienced in uh, China at Hynix and, and so on. Once a potentially disruptive event is noticed, we then need to assess the situation to decide further courses of action if required. And this is where the time spent in proactively mapping the supply chain reaps big benefits because now we can leverage that supply chain intelligence to quickly assess the potential impact and begin our response. So during the assessment phase, if we do in fact need to take action, then we move into a coordination phase. We leverage the Resilink virtual war room to see all of the required data in one place. And this reduces the manual effort of extracting data in Excel and constantly updating it. As the event continues and if things are escalating, then we move into the collaboration and execution phase, which involves closely working with different groups involved in coordinating the response-related activities needed to actively mitigate the affected suppliers, sites, or parts. Moving on, please. So what has been the impact of our program? As you can imagine, the benefits and impact of our supply chain resiliency program have been pretty significant. First, increased visibility will always help drive operational efficiencies. And by having deep visibility into our supply chain, including the sub-tiers, we've been able to make better decisions by analyzing the data and charting a course towards improvement. We can make more informed decisions about suppliers and form stronger relationships with critical supplier intelligence at our fingertips. In the area of event monitoring, having an outside third party do this for us has driven significant savings. Since event monitoring is resource intensive and costly to do ourselves, disruption event monitoring alone has paid for the cost of the program. We work with Resilink to provide them with the requirements on the type of event we want them to notify us on and they remove the duplication of effort and send us researched events which my team can quickly assess and act upon. That leads me to my next point around the value of having all the supply chain data collected and mapped. Event monitoring and the event war room functionality enables us to assess very quickly when an event has the potential to cause a disruption versus when we don't need to actively engage. This clearly saves a lot of time doing assessment type of work, especially for non-impactful events, which can nevertheless cause teams to churn with extra work. My team is able to complete the assessment and move on very quickly. And then finally, the simple fact of putting this program in place has helped executive management feel more confident that we're better informed, more proactive on top of critical areas within the supply chain very important to build that confidence with key internal stakeholders about the robustness of our business. Next slide, please. So what has been the impact of our program? Who remembers Winter Storm Nemo? I'm sure a lot of you do, and some of the other events that we've had over the last couple of years. But this specific event uh, provides a nice story to clarify some of the points that I've just made. So the winter storm hit, blanketed a large population area with snow, ice, and wind, causing outages and the potential for supply chain disruptions. 
we were not only aware of the event in real time, but we were also able to quickly assess the potential impact before the storm hit based on the expected path and our knowledge of exactly which sites were in its path. Having our supply chain already mapped and available allowed us to understand which products, parts, sites, and even revenue might be potentially impacted by the storm. In fact, we were able to assess and notify executive management of the overall risk within hours. We were able to articulate the steps that we needed to take to prevent long-term impact or worst-case scenarios. You want to talk about a confidence booster? That allowed us to build more momentum for the program overall, and it's been a great program, I might add. So in closing, as I look at lessons learned and our go-forward plan on the next slide, I reflect back on the year and what lessons I've learned and my team's learned and what experiences that we've taken away from this and what we are looking to do moving forward. So the first lesson learned is clearly to follow a process, communicate what you will do clearly, measure your results, and then refine it over time. Maybe call it a plan, communicate, measure, and repeat. Supply chain resiliency is a long-term journey, not something that happens in six months, and it certainly has evolved over the years that I've been in the industry. So we have to embark on a course where we can now measure results regularly and adjust tactics and continue expanding and growing our capabilities while we deepen our visibility. The second lesson is to empower your team, both internal and external. Strive for improved results. Success is driven from all around cooperation, not only within my team, but also with our suppliers and with Resilink. And we're incorporating resiliency into our metrics and processes and making risk-aware decisions a part of our normal operating model, including bringing it to the very beginning of our uh, business uh, as far as new product introduction and development schedule and making it a requirement as we bring on new suppliers. We've made it a long-term commitment and we aim to continue to drive greater business commitment into this critical effort. And to that end, we're incorporating design and resiliency practices and policies, as well as ensuring that the business incentives and policies are aligned with our overall resiliency objectives. We believe that this is an important next step as we evolve and mature our capabilities over the coming months. ResLink has been a great tool for us, and we look forward to what is in the future for them. So that's it for me. I'd like to now turn this over to Bindia. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, John, uh, first slide. So everyone, thank you for being here today. Uh, my focus today will be to discuss, uh, take this to the uh, next level and somewhat summarize it as well for everyone. Um, my, uh, we, I'll talk about the, uh, as, you know, the overall approach and um, the core elements for a scalable, repeatable, and did I say affordable supply chain resiliency program that really scales and grows over time rather than tapers down as many of the initiatives in the area of supply chain risk management tend to do. So the key words here, if you heard, are scalable, repeatable, affordable, grows over time. Um, so this is, you know, this approach and this thought process is based on my personal experience working in supply chain as a practitioner in the areas of sourcing, procurement, and supply chain, as well as what we have um, seen uh, and what our customers have experienced over the last few years. So I'll talk about some of the key capabilities that you've obviously heard from Simon and Vani uh, and summarize those and also talk about how we bring supply chain resiliency to our, our organizations and our business. So from... Our, from working over the, on this problem for many years, we've developed this three-step uh, approach, which is really plan, monitor, protect. Um, within plan, we see that best-in-class companies really foundationally work with their suppliers to really understand their global manufacturing footprint and their sub-tier dependencies. As we just heard from Vani, 
Um, you know, and what we have seen as well, I'm sure, in our own businesses, our ERP, our logistic systems, they don't typically provide insights into our where our supplier factories and distribution footprint is actually located. We might have an address for a supplier's headquarters or corporate offices, but we don't know where our parts are coming from. So, and nor do we always know who are the subcontractors that they use and where parts that we buy are actually originating. What is the journey that they follow through two or three or four countries before they hit our factory? So as sourcing experts and supply chain ma uh, managers, we are often uh, find we find ourselves unable to identify what are those areas of the globe where either a lot of our supplier factories have aggregated or where in the sub-tier supply chain where ha has our risk aggregated. So the first step is to really map the supply chain, identify the operations and subcontractors and sub-tier suppliers, and and go down to part number levels and really understand where where stuff is, what is the path that raw materials are taking. Um, but, and, but not only that, as Vani showed you, ultimately it's very important to not only have all this stuff in a database, but have visuals and maps where you can see the hotspots, where you can see the sub-tier aggregation happen. Um, the important thing with, along with mapping, what we really see is the two things around quantification and mitigation. So in quantification, I'll spend a little bit more time in the next two slides on that, but really the area, uh, the two things about risk quantification is understanding what are my highest impact suppliers, highest impact sites, or highest impact part numbers that can really um, have a major impact if I lose the supply of these supplier sites or parts, and it's not spend. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but the, the impact-based analytic really helps us build the business case for proactive mitigation, and many people talk to us about that, so I'll talk about that in my next slide. But I'll also show you how we can take these types of impact analytics and vulnerabilities using risk scores uh, of different types to really help direct mitigation activities to those areas which need the uh, topmost attention from your very limited resources. So that brings me to mitigation, which is really protecting our big exposure areas proactively. You know, our customers all tell us, and I'm sure you all experience as well, that commodity management is one of the most tapped into role in a company. These guys are pulled into everything, all the way from product design, firefighting on um, uh, shortages, allocations, day-to-day -day problems, quality problems, as well as strategic and in addition to their, all of this in addition to their regular roles, which is really managing the supplier, building the relationships, doing the qualifications and, and uh, getting cost savings quarter over quarter. These are very critical business resources and they need to have relevant, actionable information delivered to their fingertips, which allows them to focus their very limited attention and time on those business areas and vulnerabilities that they need to work on first. So the right type of information and analytic is very important to enable these people to uh, continue focused uh, on strategic proactive mitigation activities, which can sometimes take a backseat to the day-to-day -day fires that they need to fight, uh, which have an impact today. So we'll talk about that as well in a little bit. Uh, but mainly I want to also, we've heard quite a lot about monitoring. So along with the mapping of the supply chain and identifying critical areas, it's also very important to have our pulse, our finger on the pulse of global events. Uh, you know, And there are so many different ways, as John flashed a slide for you early on, which showed almost 100 factory fires over the last 12 months were tracked by ResLink. And that was only for the top three verticals which we focused on. So there were a lot more that happened that we weren't really covering in other, other verticals and other industries. So, but when we start to look at events, we see like, you know, a factory fire that happens halfway around the world may not even get uh, reported uh, widely or it may get reported in a local language newspaper. 
And and it might happen to a tier two or three supplier. Sometimes that factory fire can hit us two months later in the form of a tier one supplier pushing out a PO, a part going on allocation. And that at that point, we may not even realize that the root cause of this problem is that tier two supplier fire that happened, uh, which put multiple of our tier one suppliers in short supply on some critical parts. So therefore, monitoring of in multiple languages, events like factory fires, port strikes, transportation strikes, any kind of human or labor disruptions, um, whether you do these yourself, uh, whether you use a provider like Resilink, it's important not to make sure. Uh, it's important not to only track the earthquakes and hurricanes and floods and tornadoes, but also things like FDA actions, recalls, regulatory action. You know, in Junctions by OSHA or um, uh, EPA can sometimes shut down a factory for some time. So it, the important thing, and, and it's very interesting because one of the auto companies I recently spoke with said that, um, and, and also Resilink has observed this because we see the multi-tier map of the global supply chain across multiple verticals. And what we have found is that the world is really converging in the tier three and four level to a small subset of companies. And these companies are, if you have a high-tech dependency in your product, meaning you have some chip and displays types of products, then you're really depending on some limited three or four companies which are located in Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, et cetera. So an auto company today might be very well find itself competing for parts suddenly for chip supply with an Apple. And I think we all know who would win that fight. So monitoring is really important to give the give the players additional uh, uh, time to get ahead of the game, get, on, get at the table, grab inventory, grab capacity, and protect the critical areas of their supply chain, and quickly. Um, now, next slide, John. So I'll talk about the risk quantification next. This is very important in our estimation, this whole concept of impact. Uh, how do we quantify risk? It's really impact and likelihood. So if we think about what is impact, you know, the, the, those areas, those suppliers, sites, or parts in your supply chain who have the highest impact, um, meaning um, you know, what is the impact to business if you cannot get the supply? And that is really defined by what are the products that use those supplier sites or parts and where, what is the revenue or what is some a quantified number associated with those products. Now, you know, typically when we talk to anyone in supply chain, we might hear the definition of a critical part is actually 20% of my suppliers, 80% of the spend, and this is really what we find institutionalized. But I think we all realize that you would not be happy to receive your newest iPhone with a button missing or a connector missing. So the point is even the little parts in a product that you may or may not even see or realize that it's there could be critical in a, a cr critical uh, supply uh, issue when it comes to getting the product out the door. So therefore, that long tail that we are not looking at in our day-to-day -day business might might actually have some very critical semi-custom custom type of parts. Uh, like for example, if we look at Apple's products, you know these are products we all use very regularly. So I put those out there. Um, but, you know, we might think the expensive parts on these products might be the display, some of the modules on sensor or camera modules or something, you know, more complex like that. But, you know, you see the button, and that button might be used on all three product lines. And if you have, and obviously that might be a custom design part for the company. And so it actually has a very disproportionately high impact to business in case of a disruption, because it's not just used on a single product. So, Expensive is important, obviously, not to say it's not, but I think what I'm trying to articulate is that a hybrid strategy that looks at impact as well as spend together is really needed today to identify what are the most critical uh, parts of the supply chain. Next slide. So, 
Again, impact, we talked about, let's look at the next part of the thing is likelihood. Uh, when we think about likelihood, we really think about the relative risk of one part, one supplier, or one site going down versus another, which we articulate in terms of risk scores. And um, you know, the risk scores is really, uh, we in the, in the supply chain, we typically tend to focus on operational risk for the most part. And then some companies among us might be looking at financial risk, which is great and very important. Uh, but we kind of stop there. When it comes to location risk, a lot of times we haven't mapped the supply chain. Therefore, we may not even have the correct location of the supplier. And so we may not be looking at the right location risk assessment if we think about it. So so in addition to mapping, it's very important to have four different types of risk scores that we look at. Uh, financial risk of the supplier, very important. Uh, location risk, which is the location of the factories or warehouses or the D DCs or you know supply chain locations that touch the part, as well as recovery, meaning that's you know a combination of recovery time, which uh, we heard about from Simon which can come up with some really weird recovery times of, you know, 52 weeks, 70 weeks, et cetera, especially as you start looking at more complex manufacturing capability, those recovery times can go up there. And lastly, obviously, operational risk, which most companies do for many of our suppliers. So a, a complete well-rounded risk scores that looks at these four things allows us to do an apple-to-apple -apple comparison across the suppliers within a given commodity group or commodity family. And that is a great way to then look at the risk um, in terms of impact as well as vulnerability and really identify what are those topmost areas of the supply chain that we need to focus on. High impact to business, high risk score because the supplier has a financial problem or a location issue or a very long recovery time. These are the areas that bring out, that should be popping out of your very complex, very um, vastly spread out supply chain. Next slide. So then, okay, so great, we do the mapping, we do the, um, we do the quantification, we do the risk scoring. Uh, how, how do we then take a proactive approach to it? You know, so what is the, what is the methodology? And this is kind of what we see best in class companies do is the, the framework for thinking about it. And I haven't looked at, I haven't included operational risk because operational risk is very well understood. Uh, but the three concepts around financial location recovery risk is really, you know, sometimes we think, well, I have to second source everything if I wanted to de-risk everything in my supply chain. Well, the reality is no. You only have to de-risk for risk mitigation if you truly find that the supplier is financially unviable long term. Otherwise, you can look at valid, cost-effective other sources. Uh, sources of risk mitigation, which can be equally effective, but not only that, that can help you form more strategic partnerships with your suppliers, such as working on alternate locations for r making sure that the alternate site is ready and available with a faster recovery time by putting in place some business continuity for, or, or um, pre-qualifying a site or doing some readiness type of work with the supplier. So, uh, and obviously inventory as a stopgap measure can certainly help when you have highly impactful parts in the business, then definitely that is a business case for putting a little bit more inventory as a buffer and not cutting inventory on those high impact parts. So these are definitely valid alternate strategies in addition to second sourcing, which should definitely be considered when you have a supplier who is not financially robust. Um, up, uh, the next slide. So when you think about it, when it comes to effective and complete risk management, it's not just second sourcing, it's not just inventory, it's not just proactive, but and it's certainly not just we're not going to do anything because it's too complex, it's too hard. I'm just going to, I haven't been hurt in the past, which is great if you're a gambler, but not so good for a business executive like people uh, who are listening today. So really there are four approaches. One is obviously the risk 
take acceptance. There are some parts, some suppliers, some sites you don't need to worry about. They fall within the acceptable risk threshold. So the first step is really understand what is your risk threshold and then identify which of those supplier sites or parts fall within your uh, threshold. The second is understanding, um, you know, what you cannot mitigate. You cannot mitigate it. A single source, there's only one place in the world, only one site in the world that can build it. If I wanted to set up another wafer fab, it would be a $9 billion price tag. Well, then maybe you want to look at insurance. So uh, contingent business interruption insurance is also a mitigation approach where, where you cannot do anything about something. It's just the reality that is something you do risk travel for on. And the other two things are you find the right balance, which is you take your highest exposure, highest vulnerability, part numbers, sites, and suppliers, and you say, okay, for these, I'm going to buy myself some reaction time by doing more inventory, doing a pre-qual with the supplier, uh, maybe doing second sourcing where appropriate, et cetera. And then for the rest of it, I'm going to have a robust monitoring program, which allows me to be first to the table when a bad thing happens which we all know it might um, in the next few years. So when something happens, um, I'm first to the table because I'm always on top of global events, always there reacting and assessing uh, and uh, moving on after I've done my research. So that, that four thing, those four approaches really formulate your complete and comprehensive risk mitigation or risk management strategy, which is acceptance, transfer, mitigation, and crisis management. And the beauty of this, next slide, John, the, the beauty of this is there is a real and tangible ROI associated with it. So it's not like you're always going to be spending, spending, spending and not realizing, and it's not just an avoidance ROI. And the savings, nice to hear, are that these can be recurring savings, uh, as well as obviously on a per disruption basis. Now, companies like uh, those who buy contingent business interruption or CBI coverage, you might find yourself that you're paying maybe a 10 cent penalty for every hundred dollars of insured profits because you don't have the ma a robust mapping and um, the risk aggregation uh, and uh, global hotspots visible visualization capability in place. So this can actually be millions of dollars in insurance premiums that you are paying today and a and a two to five or even a five to eight percent premium reduction could pay for the cost of the mapping for a couple of years out. Um, now, your sourcing teams, you know, in supply chain, we focus on there's a reason we are only able to manage 20 percent of suppliers with 80 percent of spend. It's because our processes and tools are so manual. We use Excel, email, maybe some access homegrown things that we force our people to spend 50 percent more time getting to action insights and getting to the exceptions. Therefore, a solution-based approach that really connects the intra-company data, like your suppliers, parts, products, etc., with external mapping insights like factories, risks, risk events, risk scores, etc., can bring a tremendous amount of efficiency and uh, value to these people and allow these people to manage many more suppliers cost effectively without adding resources. And uh, I can't say enough about disruption savings, but those are substantial. You know, today there's a likelihood of close to 100% probability that we in the supply chain will experience a major disruption about every two years. And so the ability to save on premiums on raw material and freight or avoid a lines down situation or uh, better resource utilization on a single event alone can pay for the cost of a program like this for decades. So in the, in, in the end, it's really the choice is do we gamble with our shareholder money or do we proactively find the critical areas of the business and be, a, be more deliberate about managing risks across the supply chain? Um, that's all from me. Um, John? Uh, thanks, thanks, Bindia, and, and great job to all the speakers, and thanks, everyone, for joining today.